and welcome to Four Wheels Good, the only weekly motoring program to run right the way throughout the year. Well, this week we have once again a huge variety of motoring features for you in our continuing look at latest technologies. Ian Royal will be finding out what the Skynet satellite security system has to offer in a world bristling with competing hardware. Mike Rutherford looks at how solar power could actually drive a car, but how fast will he be able to go? Find out later. He'll also be chatting to some Grand Prix stars while we reveal who'll be VIP guests of Goodyear Tyres at the British Grand Prix. And if you're as impressed as we are by the commercial campaign for the new Ford Puma, find out later how they managed to make it look as if Steve McQueen was actually driving the new car. But first, let's fly to Spain to have a drive of a new version of a car which has sold over 24 million since its first appearance in the late 1960s, the Toyota Corolla. The image of the Corolla is one of solid reliability and value for money, one that you'd expect from the world's best-selling car. So the temptation must be for Toyota to stick with what works. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Corolla has uh, held its position as the world's best-selling car really because of the number of times that it's been changed and improved over the years. And that is a process that uh, continues to this day and the latest model takes Corolla to uh, another step uh, forward uh, in terms of technical specification and uh, the uh, feature and equipment on the vehicle. The Corolla um, has been a world car for a long period of time, uh, but again, the evolution process for Corolla has led it in three different directions, and tastes in different parts of the world vary. We now have uh, a version for the Japanese domestic market and for Asia, and also one for North America, and the one that we've just introduced, the new European Corolla, which is uh, engineered and designed very much for the European motoring needs. There are four body styles available in the new Corolla. A three-door hatchback, an estate, a saloon, and this, a five-door liftback, which they think will be the best-selling model. Add this to the various engine and trim levels, and you'll really be stuck for choice from the 21 Corollas that will be available to us in the UK. Toyota haven't made the mistake of putting all their effort into fantastic exterior styling and forgetting all about the interior, banging it in as an afterthought. They've actually made a really good job of it. Gone is the beloved black plastic of so many Japanese manufacturers, replaced by lighter, brighter interior that comes in a whole array of choices. And boy, does it really make a difference.
Well, obviously, the uh, Corolla has already, ha already has many, many strengths, uh, but we have heard that uh, a little bit of uh, fun, a little bit more uh, driving excitement um, uh, would be appreciated by our owners, and that's something we've tried to deliver with the new model. Uh, the suspension has been changed. Uh, obviously, the style as well of the vehicle overall uh, has been uh, made more interesting from the uh, consumer's point of view. Some of the fabrics inside, the design elements, um, altogether more lively, uh, we think more fun overall, certainly more fun to drive. position is also extremely comfortable, steering wheel well laid out and the seats are nice and firm and I've heard no complaints from anybody about the amount of space inside the cabin which is far greater than it was last time around. Well, I think in Europe uh, we're more emotionally involved with our cars. Uh, we, we like them obviously to be uh, reliable and economical and good value, but we also like style and flair and uh, in certain markets as well a little passion too. And that's something that we've tried to build in to the new Corolla and we think we've been successful. First of all, we have a thing called the design panel, uh, and that is made up of representatives of the Toyota companies in Europe. Now, we're obviously quite close to the marketplace. We know what our customers want, and we've tried to reflect that very much in the design, and we've helped the Japanese designers understand the requirements of the European market. Now, the other aspect, of course, is research, which is very, very important, and the new Corolla was researched in Europe as well, so that we could be sure that we got it absolutely right for Euro European motorists. is certainly very different this time around and makes for an extremely distinctive car and traditional Corolla drivers may be a little shocked but love it or hate it you will have an opinion on it there can be no accusations this time that the Corolla looks bland its success has been built on a very methodical approach of improvement, um, always improving on a solid base. And that, again, is the trend that uh, has been continued with the new model. There have been many, many improvements, but we've also kept what was good about Corolla, particularly the strength, the safety, uh, the reliability. These are attributes that our owners currently appreciate, and we don't want to lose any of that. So um, there's the old saying, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And the Corolla is definitely not broken, and we've just improved it as we've uh, introduced the new model. I think uh, all cars, all modern cars have moved on a great deal from the, from the early days, the days of the 60s when the Corolla was first introduced uh, and uh, it is a radically different car, a much stronger car, a much safer car, uh, better specified car uh, and we've already discussed a car uh, that is um, uh, tailored for the European marketplace, um, fun, lively and stylish.
we think that we've got um, a model in our range that would meet everybody's requirements. We can offer economy, we can offer performance, uh, and uh, we think as well in terms of practicality, we have the body styles uh, that will accommodate the requirements of uh, pretty well any family, uh, and that is very much where the Corolla is aimed for the, uh, for the family motorist. We already build the Creenery at our factory at Burniston near Derby, and we build engines uh, at Deeside in North Wales. So we already have a major investment in the UK, something like £800 million already invested. There's another £200 million being invested just for the new Corolla. And uh, towards the end of next year, 1998, we will start building the new Corolla at our plant at Burniston. We'll start with the five-door liftback, but eventually a year later the hatchback as well will be introduced into that particular plant. And we'll also build additional engines at Deeside, not just, as I say, for Carina Ree, but also for Corolla as well. So uh, this is a tremendous further investment, uh, more jobs for the UK, more exports from the UK, and Toyota is very much part of the UK manufacturing scene. In fact, in many respects, um, a leading member uh, of uh, UK industry. So have those engineering tweaks to make the Corolla more fun actually worked? Well, they have resulted in a smoother and much quieter ride. The handling is far better and it's more responsive to the driver. You actually feel a bit more at one with the vehicle. The 1.65 door test version that we drove has enough punch and it can hold its own in most road conditions. Overall, the Corolla is easy to drive. It performs well and it feels solid. As for fun, well, it's not totally packed with the F factor, but there is enough to put a bit of a smile on your face. There's absolutely no doubt that this time it's a much better car than the old version. It may not be bursting with style and it doesn't excite and thrill too much behind the wheel. But let's face it, the Toyota Corolla is never going to do that. That's not why it's already sold around 24 million vehicles worldwide. What you do have here is still reliable, it's well built, it offers excellent value for money with a high level of specification. And I've no doubt that it's a car that will have no problems pushing those already enviable sales figures even higher. New Toyota Corolla on test drive around Barcelona. A curious bug-eyed car, but at least it has more style than the previous model. I wonder if it'll still be top in the annual JD Power customer satisfaction listings. Well, after break, Mike Rutherford looking ridiculous, but all in the name of trying to save the planet by driving an extraordinary solar car. We'll be back very soon. Hi and welcome back. This is Four Wheels Good, your weekly motoring magazine programme. We cover everything from classic cars to the latest models, but we're about to look at one now which you won't have seen at your local dealership. Not that many people would want to buy one of these vehicles. It wouldn't fit in most people's garages. Look, 
The reason we're shouting is we're thankfully, for once, in South London, my part of the world, on the busy, noisy streets of South London. And we're here because we're at South Bank University, which used to be South Bank Poly until a year or two ago. And they've done some amazing things here. The students and the lecturers in the engineering department here in South London have actually got together, spent a few thousand pounds, peanut money as they say, to build a solar powered car. A car that relies on nothing but the good old British sunshine. What did they do with that car? They took it to Australia, they competed in the biggest solar powered car race in the world, they took on the likes of Honda and some of the other big car manufacturers on this planet and they did pretty well for themselves. Now the idea is we're going to go in and speak to some of the guys involved and with a bit of luck might even get to drive what is one of Britain's only solar powered cars. Well I'm joined by Mike Duke the uh, senior engineering lecturer here at uh, South Bank, what I used to know is South Bank Poly, South Bank Polytechnic, but these days, Mike, it's South Bank University. Yeah, yeah but I'm afraid every, all, every Polytechnic now is a university, you know, it's all been upgraded, so mm. to speak. Mm. Well, that's another story. Um, first of all, I should explain that I know his name's Mike Duke because high tech, white coat, felt pen, M Duke. So that works well. Uh, Mike, come on, let's get down to serious business. Right. This car, yep. you've been out to Australia in this yep. car. This is a solar powered car, but here we are, we're virtually into June, yeah. and you don't need to be a genius to work out that you don't get a great deal of sun in Britain. So how much sun do you need to power a solar powered car? Well, it all depends on how far you want to go. I mean, this car on a day like today will probably do about 100 kilometers. So on a really sunny day, it'll do 500 kilometers. So if you want to drive, 100 kilometers every day, which is what's that, about 60 miles, then this car would do the, do the business. So what you're really saying, Mike, is that the British climate is, or well, could be ideal for solar-powered cars, although that we don't get too much sunshine, you do get enough sunshine to power one of these things. Yeah, it just depends on how far you want to go. Like I say, um, uh, we're going to build a car for the Millennium, the 2000, which is going to be just a commuter car for London. Mm. And, you know, it won't, won't be like this. This is a racing car. It'll be a car with a couple of doors you get in, you know, mm. enough space for a, take your shopping in, and we'll prove it. I was going to say, why is this thing such a ridiculous shape? Because uh, this is the rules in Australia. So if you want to, you know, instead it could be six metres long, two metres wide, single seater, eight square metres of solar cell. It's like the race regulation. So we built it to the regs, and this is pretty much how they come out. I know it's a difficult question to answer, but if we are talking about mass production of solar powered cars, perhaps for people in cities, mm. what sort of cost are we talking about? Can we say they're 50% more expensive, 50% less expensive to build? You know, is there any ballpark figures you can throw us? This is peanut money. We, this is probably the cheapest car in the race, 20,000 quid. Mm. And what, how would that compare? I seem to remember there are those fancy ads at the moment for the Honda, which uh, I think won the event. Yeah. And if you, if you think of a huge Japanese corporation like that, no wonder. What sort of money would they have spent? Well, the, the estimates are somewhere between 10 and 20 million around that. You're sort. kidding. No, the, the, when they went out there, they had a team of 140 people went with them. We had five. I mean, it's just a different level of technology they're, they're working on. Are we ever talking about the stage where people will be able to use solar powered cars as ordinary everyday cars, maybe in cities? low speeds, low mileage. Yeah, there's no problem with that at all. But I think what you have to remember is like that it's a bit like the water in the reverse. You know, during the summertime, um, everything gets charged up. You know, you might have batteries at home which are charged up and batteries on the car which are charged up. And during the wintertime, they'll gradually run down until the summer comes again. Mm. And uh, whereas water is the opposite. You know, we fill our reservoirs during the wintertime mm. and then drain them down during the summer. Mm. So it's just a slightly, it's like the reverse of the water. And it certainly could be done. Mm. But if you want to travel really long distances, then um, just purely solar power like this isn't quite yet viable. Oh. So it, it seems like there's a, there's a valid comparison there with, say, battery-powered cars. Low mileage, fairly low speeds, limited use, probably a, a viable second car. I think in the future, see, it's all about legislation. It's, it's, if people don't want you know, fumes in their cities, for example, and don't want kids getting aspirin and all that stuff, then they'll legislate against petrol cars. And so they'll, they'll just have to head towards this type of vehicle. And when, when people when there's a change in legislation, suddenly you'll notice a massive improvement in the performance of these cars because everybody will be working on them. Mm. One last question I've got to ask you. Um, you're a senior engineering lecturer at uh, South Bank uh, University, and you're how old is that, Lee? 33. I must be getting old. Seven years younger than me, and he's a university lecturer.
totally looked ridiculous. That's Mike for you, always a man for attracting the crowds, even if they are open mouths that are bizarre two-mile-an-hour prototype. Still, they laughed at Edison at first, didn't they? Well, now, on to a slightly more conventional type of technology. There are lots of different types of security systems for cars, but which are really the most effective to get your car back? Ian Royal reports on the remarkable Skynet system. Speaking from the alarm centre, we've had a, a, an alarm come up for a stolen vehicle. Car security is a growing market. There are many devices available from the simple lock for your car steering wheel through to alarms and immobilisers and the latest from AA Tracker. But new to the market is something called Skynet. With me is Tony Haywood from Skynet. Tony, tell me about this car. This is a, a normal Vauxhall Vectra. It's equipped with Skynet. How does it work? Well, basically, by looking at the car, the would-be thief, he wouldn't realise that there is a Skynet on the car. There's a built-in immobiliser. Basically, if this thief was to make a glass break um, alarm, then he would think he can just bypass this, the car and drive it away. But unfortunately, with a Skynet unit, we've got a few tricks up our sleeve. So how does Skynet compare with other products on the market? Well, basically, Skynet is an information system. It's a tracking system, and it's also an alarm system and a communication system. So we feel we've covered all the areas. From the theft point of view, just looking at the car, you wouldn't really think there was a Skynet on the vehicle because it's all covert aerials. Now basically, if a thief was to break the window or open the door, and then he thinks he can bypass uh, a normal immobiliser, he's wrong, because with there being a Skynet system on, it will trigger an immediate alarm back to Central Station, and we'll be watching him immediately. Now I think the other main product we've seen on the market is AA's tracker system. How does Skynet compare against tracker? Well Skynet basically, it, it's our own system. We have our own bureau, 24 hour manned, in London. And we can, within seven seconds, this car will modulate on the computer and give us immediate direction and position of where the car is. So I may be interested in something like this. Convince me, show me how it works, okay? Right. So Tony, we're on the move now. Uh -huh. uh, to, to get the screen going, it's just a matter of touching that. That's and it comes basically. up with the information pad. It's quite simple to make a call on this. It's a hands-free GSM car phone. That's right. Fairly easy. I press make a call. You press make the call. And then dial it, tap in the number. Yes. Send, and you get a, a hands-free digital phone through to wherever you're going to. That's what right. other features has, has the, the unit got on it that you can show us? Basically, it's also got, if we go back to, it's got an information button which, by holding that in for seven seconds, it takes you through to our central station. And there's an operator at the end of there which will find out on the computer where we are and she can direct us or give us any information that we may need to know. So that's dialing up your central Skynet information centre. That's right. I'm going to be needing some petrol. Uh, my red lights come on and basically, uh, I'm not used to the area and I don't know where the local petrol station is. Okay, if you bear with me one second, Tony, I'll just uh, direct you to the nearest petrol station. Bearing in mind, I am on the move, so I'm updating all the time, you see. So, okay, one second. Can the, can the satellite track the movement of the car? Yes, it tracks the movement of the car. It updates every 30 seconds. So at the moment, she's tapping into your database, yes. and she's looking for the nearest petrol station for us to, to drop off and, uh, That's right. and pick some petrol up. That's right. What are the... Uh, facilities are there on offer apart from petrol stations em emergency services there's the emergency services also everything can be done via the central station if we was to need assistance regarding the police in a road rage situation by pressing the distress button that gets us through to central station 
they can contact the police, they can give them our location, and they can give them our situation, basically. Okay, so the number A57. Yes. There was actual elf petrol station. Just off Eccles New Road. On Eccles New Road? That's right. So, I'm on the A57 at the moment, am I? That's right, yeah. Now, the main selling point of Skynet, Tony, is that it is a deterrent against theft. Yes. How does the, the theft deterrent work on this car? If somebody bypasses the immobiliser by joining out the wires or however they do it, then basically they're in the car and they're on the move. It will send an alarm situation back to central station we then will know that the car has been stolen we will have voice contact with the car we will tell the people that they are being tracked and the local police are being informed if they don't believe us they could just maybe play a game with us and ask us where are they and we'll tell them exactly where they are and if we know where they are the police know where they are you're not only protecting your vehicle which if you work, if your vehicle is, is also your, your tool of work, to lose your vehicle for a few days or a month or, or whatever can disrupt your business. But it's, it's also protection of the occupants. Now you see, you can't hide from a satellite. Well, it's time to take a quick break now and then we'll find out how a late screen legend has managed to test drive the new coupe from Ford. The trade secrets in a few minutes. Hi and welcome back to Four Wheels Good. Now, we love the new Ford Puma Coupe, it's an excellent drive, but would Steve McQueen have driven it if he were alive? Ford's advertising agency negotiated with the estate of the late actor to include his footage from Bullet to be part of the TV and cinema commercial. Peter Baker reports. We've all seen the astonishing advert for the new Ford Puma. One bright spark at the ad agency Young and Rubicum came up with recreating part of the famous chase scene from Bullet featuring Steve McQueen. A great classic film, a great new car. But making Steve McQueen look like he's driving the new Ford Puma? No, I'm not going to say, how did they do that? But why did they do that? In order to get to the creative idea, we took uh, the three themes that underlie the vehicle itself, its daring personality, its true style, and of course the exhilarating drive. And we synthesised these into a proposition or a statement that our target audience would understand. And that proposition was freedom for your untamable spirit. And it was the notion of untamable spirit, really, that led us to McQueen, because he was somewhat un untamable, he had great spirit, and he loved motor cars. And so it just seemed natural that we should somehow use him. And action, action, action. Long shots of the Puma in San Francisco were the easy bits. You can't see who's driving, and the only hassle really is getting the streets completely clear. But every frame of the ad which had Steve McQueen in had to be carefully storyboarded and planned well in advance. The concept uh, to uh, promote the new Ford Puma and um, basically uh, utilising footage of, of Steve McQueen from the movie Bullet um, and incorporating him from like a late, late 1967 to 69 period into like contemporary San Francisco. The first time we see McQueen is when a passerby is astonished at the sleek lines of the Puma. The camera pulls back and we see McQueen's eyes, or not in this case. In the finished ad, his eyes are digitally superimposed over the mirror. Shots from the actual movie Bullet had to be carefully analysed. Some rejected. Then an actor with McQueen's build, hair, and clothes sense was hired to literally stand in. Even the closing of the door, a split second shot in the final Puma commercial, took hours to set up and shoot.
However, the fun part begins. On the hard disk-based editing system, the stand-in actor's face appears in the new set. Out of hundreds of takes, the best angles are selected to match the existing McQueen pictures from Bullet. Then, thanks to digital matching, the actor's head is removed. And McQueen's added. Every single frame is cleaned up pixel by pixel to create a seamless join. For the VT editor, it's a painstaking job. I had to scour the film uh, all the way through uh, and started the film and work out what shots we were going to use of Steve McQueen first. Uh, so I've never watched a feature film uh, so much in my life before. We have to actually isolate him completely. So every frame of Steve, we have to draw a mat around him and then they would call it a black and white mat. And that's what we put on top of our material that we shot in San Francisco, so i.e. our car or you know, the garage scene. So when we've done that, then we have full control. So we're taking his head off and we stick it on top of the body so then we can actually isolate it and move it together. So they're like married together. Um, so that's a specific method we're doing now. We're doing it at such a high resolution that uh, when we eventually go back to film and do a full grade to marry all the colours together to make Steve look like he is tied into the film, um, it will look perfect. Perfect like the car? If you haven't yet driven the Puma, get down to your regional specialist dealer and ask for a test drive. The steering wheel may be annoyingly non-adjustable, rear visibility may not be brilliant, but these are small drawbacks when you consider that the Ford Puma is an astonishingly able and willing sporting coupe that is fantastically fun to drive as well. Handling is positive, it has a solid feel and even the engine noise sounds sexy. Some may criticise Ford for using a dead man to promote a new car, but somehow I feel that if Steve McQueen were alive today, he'd certainly have a Puma in his garage, even if it were no good for jumping the barbed wire in concentration camps. Yes, well, it certainly is a great new coupe. And next week, Ginny Buckley will have a review of the new Honda Prelude coupe. Well, would it be great to go and buy a new car regularly on a whim? In the real world, of course, we're all scrimping for our next bit of maintenance on our old runners. That's why John Wright is here every week on the Inside Motors feature to show us how to do things ourselves. I wonder who's getting on replacing that Fiesta head gasket. Right, let's just find the right socket for the next bit. Yeah, that's the right one. Right, you'll find on Japanese cars you're using lots of 12mm and 10mm um, sockets. However, on European cars they're all 13s, 10s and 17s. Just seems to be a little quirk of the way they uh, build them. Get that out of the way. Right, it's a little bit of force required. Once they've gone, they've usually gone. As you can see, you can see all the black sludge and the mess in this engine. Uh, I think one of the things we're going to do is when we put it back together, we'll give it a good engine flush, and I think we'll keep doing that for the next two or three services, see if we can get rid of some of this. If the car continue to drive like this, I mean, it would just be an absolutely horrendous mess. You're looking at a new engine if it continued like this bearings, crankshaft to drop out, and what's more important for the lady that's driving it is that she'd be stranded. Uh, it'd eventually just go bang and pop and forget it. Uh, so it's a good job that the head gasket went before anything else. So those of you who want to buy 299 oil, do it at your own risk. Right, get rid of the rocker shaft. Just check it for wear and all the rest of it. Let's get rid of those. These are the push rods that operate the valves. And it's always a good idea to wiggle them as they come out. So you don't... Um, under, underneath there's a cam follower and it, you just don't want to displace that. Right, I 
I think what we'll do with these is get them to soak in some paraffin so we can clean at least some of this mess up. These old oil cans are great for putting things in, they're cheap. And we're being green, we're recycling things. Right, should be eight push rods, four bolts, just leave them in there and let the solvent do its, its job and try and get rid of some of that gunk. Cylinder head bolts need to be taken off in sequence. Normally this is from the centre of the head to the outside. If you're in any doubt at all, look it up in the manual and they give you a picture of the head with the numbers in which they're taken off. That's the first, that's the second, that's the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten. As you see, what I'm doing is starting in the centre and then going round in circles. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right, let's get on with it. Right, let's see what else has to come off. These water pipes have, have to come off, and the exhaust, and that water pipe, I think, I think that's about it. Yep. Yeah. Right, let's get rid of some of that stuff. We'll have more from Mr Mechanical John Wright next week. Another continuing story is how rally driver Mark Nuttall is getting along with the conversion of his saloon car into an official rally vehicle. We'll have more on that saga after this break. Hello again, you're watching Four Wheels Good here on the Granada Men and Motors channel. Well, on the final part of this week's programme, it's time to find out the secrets of the strengthening skeleton of a Class N rally car. In the past four weeks, we've shown you how we started to turn my ordinary road-going Skoda Felicia into a full Group N rally car. First of all, we had to strip the car of all its components. We did this from our rally base. From there, the shell was taken to a motorsport fabricators to have all the various welding done. Whilst they were busy finishing off the shell, I went to see about competition seats. I was to be measured up for a seat by seat expert Alan Whitaker. This week, we're back to check on the progress of the car. So, Matthew. Uh, the car is uh, two thirds finished. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, uh, and you're well on the way to doing it. Uh, these pipes here, these are the fuel pipes. Yeah, what, how, how are you going to attach those down? Right, what we've got here is uh, these uh, aircraft specification uh, fuel hoses, uh, which use the original car's fuel hoses would have run underneath the car. Right. So why are we putting them inside? So we put them inside so that they can't be ripped off uh, when in competition use by stones or, yeah. or branches or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and the same goes for the brake lines okay. uh, and all the safety equipment also, the extinguisher lines that will come from this bottle here, yeah. they'll also all run through the car right. to the uh, points where you can release them. So how are you going to attach this to the, to the car because you don't want them floating around Now what like we'll this. do there is we'll, we'll run a, a tray right down the centre of the car, okay. uh, that will be secured to the vehicle and all of these uh, pipes will be secured to that. So right. you've got easy access for maintenance, okay. um, but they'll be securely fastened down. Right, so it's Group N, Yeah. we've got to carry all the trim and the stuff That's uh, from right. like the back seat and the, the, the uh, carpet for the boot. Yeah. How do you envisage that we're going to carry those? Well what we've done is, as you can probably see, that all the, the trim inside has been cut to suit, suit yeah. the roll cage that we've now fitted. Yeah. Uh, and the dashboard has been cut away, etc. Yeah. Um, the seats will go back in, um, but obviously they'll have to be in the folded down position. In the case of a crash, these things have not got to move. That's right, yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll be held in rigid with bars right across here. Right. Uh, and braces underneath this, this yeah. main chassis member here. All technical stuff, eh? Yeah, well, in the event of an accident, 
and you don't want to move and you don't want anything else to move so uh, that's what it's all aimed at really yeah. for your safety you know these look the business yep these are state-of-the-art suspension units and um, right. probably the best that money can buy and um, the reason for that is that as you can see they're a spring over a damper system yeah but they are fully adjustable right um, so, which means that you can use the same suspension units yeah. no matter what sort of terrain you're going on. Right, so when you say fully adjustable, I can see that they're adjustable here. That's right, yeah. Uh, but also, you, you can adjust the bounce and the rebound. That's right, yeah. You can adjust how fast the car actually rebounds from uh, when it's come down off a, a, a so, bump or So, whatever. basically, uh, depending on how the driver finds the stage, you could... That's right adjust the yeah. bounce and the rebound of the yeah. shock absorber to adjust compensate right. yeah the basically the, the smoother that the the surfaces you're going on it for example tarmac that the harder uh, and the less movement that you would have uh, because traction wouldn't be such a problem right fascinating stuff and after that preparation they have yet to drive on the icy tracks around that rally school in norway we'll have further developments in the coming weeks well, thank you to the thousands who sent in cards for our Grand Prix competition and well done to Keith Scowcroft of Canford Heath in Poole, Dorset, for being first out of the sack with the answers. Damon's current and past teams, Arrows and Williams, and the other answer was uh, Bernie Eccleston. Keith and a partner will be VIP guests of Goodyear Tyres on Grand Prix Day. So, have a good one. Now, Mike Rutherford rubbed shoulders with some track heroes at the recent Goodwood Festival of Speed. Eddie, the last time I spoke, if you could leave your paper alone for a minute, we were in uh, Suzuka. Well, this is so interesting, anyway, go on. <laughs> we were in Suzuka, and you were telling me, and that was on the eve of you becoming a teammate of one Michael Schumacher, you told me you were going to get him over to Dublin and ply him with Guinness. Did that ever happen? Um, I don't remember ever saying that. You did? Did I? Well, it's never happened. <laughs> he's not visited you over there? No, uh, Michael's, you know, he's, he's a family man, so he always goes home to the family. Yeah. They, all the talk also was of him destroying you like he did with all these previous teammates and that hasn't exactly happened, does it? I mean, you've done uh, better than any other. Well, if, in comparison, I guess I'm closer than all the other teammates, but he's won my five races for Ferrari and I haven't won any yet. I've, had, I've been close in Argentina, but, you know, I finished second there and two-thirds this year, so he's, he's got the upper hand. Right. I mean, you've had your critics this season, but at the end of the day, uh, you've been on the podium, uh, what, two three, or three times? Three times now. Yeah, hey, I'm out there for me and I'm out there for my team and... Um, that's all there is to it. Yep. You know, anyone, like, everyone else, like, there's the enemy. I mean, is that the way you look at it? You don't look at these guys as no, colleagues? No, it's, um, it's war. As bad as that? It is, yeah. And when you hear somebody like, I don't know, I seem to remember Jack Villeneuve had words to say, I thought Johnny Herbert was very cruel about you two or three years ago when he said some remark on a first corner somewhere, and he's, he keeps having a pop. I mean, what, how do you get on with these guys when you meet them after the race? I just say hello to them, but I've, you know, I've no, um, no feelings for them one way or the other, but if they're in the track, I'm going to have them if I can. Johnny, what are you doing here today? You, you, you got a day off from uh, the real world of Formula One, and you come to a motorsport event. Why don't you get your feet up at home? Uh, well, it was just basically I organised this a couple of couple of months ago, and it was it was just a good good time to have a good day out and uh, drive an old an old Formula One car from the 70s, and you know, and the public can see sort of the modern day drivers mm. when they are normally only see them either on the television or the mm. or the British Grand Prix. So, yeah. I mean, it's funny you should say that because you know it just occurs to me that increasingly Formula One is uh, yes, it's very entertaining, but it's it's so removed from the public these days, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's just the way I think, you know, sport in general has gone. I think athletics are exactly the same, where they, you only see them come on. They, they, they're probably there for a shorter space of time. Lymph and Christie's there for sort of 10 seconds and then he's, then he's straight off, whisked off. So, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for at least the, you know, the public to, to see us and maybe meet us in between. So you're, you're happily out there for two hours signing autographs, walking through the crowds, having a burger with the, uh, the punters? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say happily. After a sort of about 20 minutes, it's sort of then it's getting a bit sort of long in the tooth. But I can do 20 minute stints after with a few hours break. <laughs> then it's not so bad. Steve Soper, I'm sorry to remind you of Le Mans, but it was only a week ago to this to this very day. What what are your reflections uh, on your time there? Walk us through what happened. Well, basically, we didn't win. <laughs> But uh, I suppose the car was competitive, it had a problem, it ran for three and a half hours, it then broke a water pipe and we lost eight laps in the pits fixing the water pipe and basically all hope of winning the event or finishing say on the podium were probably gone then.
Um, all we tried to do was catch up and obviously eight laps you never ever catch up in a 24 hour race. But it's not just about winning is it? Isn't it all about taking part? I think I know what the answer to this question is going to be by the way. Well it's, I think if you do it for a living and you, you race every weekend and you've been racing for 20 years and it's part of your, your living, I can't say as I like the, the race. I want to do the race to come away and say I've won this fantastic historical event um, and if you or uh, as has been with me in the past people have rung me up and said do I want to drive a certain car and I know I know the car's got no hope in hell in winning then I would say no I don't want to drive and I'll stay at home and spend the time with my family rather than just turn up and n not not compete with a chance of winning. Well, it's time for us to go, but please watch Four Wheels Good next week when Lord Montague will be telling us about why he's doing the Peking to Paris run this year and we shall also report from Ireland on their uh, international mini-rally. So, from all of us here, it's goodbye.